Mr. Morneau, there are a few experts that are toying with the idea that Canada is already in a recession, specifically after uh, only seeing 0.1 growth in the last quarter. I'm wondering what you think of that and how the budget addresses some of those economic concerns. Well, they'd be incorrect. Uh, that would be uh, technically wrong and uh, certainly not in line with our expectations. What we're seeing in Canada, of course, is a, an extremely strong uh, market for uh, employment, lowest unemployment rate we've seen in uh, over 40 years. We're expecting that, uh, that yes, as we go through the uh, change in oil prices in the latter half of 2018, that the last quarter of 2018, as you saw, was, was weaker and the first quarter of 2019. But uh, we're expecting, and as you heard from the Bank of Canada, they're also expecting that we will have a, a return to growth uh, at uh, expected levels in the second quarter. And our long-term forecasts are positive. Then if you'll uh, permit me to ask about the uh, mortgage incentives as well. Uh, Obviously, uh, the uh, the five or ten percent there. I believe the maximum that might apply to is a uh, home in the value of about five hundred thousand dollars. That may not be uh, able to address too many concerns uh, for markets in Vancouver and Toronto. So I'm just curious to know whether uh, you guys had already uh, whether that was part of the plan to address markets elsewhere, or, or how you think that that will help people that are struggling to find a home in markets like Vancouver and Toronto? We expect that the initiative that we put in place, the first time home buyers incentive, will have an impact across the country, including in Toronto and Vancouver. The reason is, of course, we're looking at first time home buyers and we're looking at the opportunity for people who are just not quite able to get into that first time home buyer situation. So you'll know that the uh, criteria are families that are at $120,000 or less of family income and that there's a, uh, a expectation that the house will be somewhat less than about 500000 While that is lower than the, the average cost of housing in both those two markets, there are opportunities for families to get into housing at that market. And since we're talking about first-time home buyers, it's giving people optimism, optimism that they can get into uh, the market while being careful to ensure that we continue to have a stable housing market. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Minister, I uh, want to ask you more about the, uh, the infrastructure, municipal infrastructure top-up funding. Um, you, you've mentioned a couple of times that, that, frankly, the government's been having trouble getting the infrastructure spending commitments fully out the door. Um, wondering as we go forward beyond this top-up, what you're looking at in terms of the structure, the process, the approval system, um, maybe where, the, where the, those decision-making processes uh, originate to speed this up and actually be able to get the, the enormous amount of money you guys have committed actually in play? Well, we are making progress on uh, all of our infrastructure goals. There's been about 33,000 infrastructure projects approved since we've put in place our infrastructure plan early in our mandate. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in uh, the uh, speech this morning, this uh, previous year, we had about $13.9 billion in uh, investments in infrastructure from the federal government that went out. But as I also mentioned, we haven't been able to do exactly what we expected, and that was the reason for the municipal infrastructure top-up. What you shouldn't do is take this as a conclusion on how we will go forward, but what it is is it's an important way for us to move forward now in getting some projects that are stalled going, having a real impact on people in the, uh, in the more immediate term, and also uh, building strong infrastructure for the longer term. And what, obviously there's an awful lot in this, there's a lot of components to this budget will probably require a significant number of, uh, of, of laws tabled uh, in order to, to, to pass all, of the, uh, uh, all the initiatives in here. Not a lot of days left uh, in, in the current session. Um, You've been criticized in the past about omnibus uh, budget bills. Um, how are you looking at presenting this? And are, are, you, are you, I guess, sensitive to those criticisms and looking not to table enormous omnibus, uh, omnibus bill? In well, this well a, a budget bill, by definition, is to put in place the measures that we've put forward in the budget. So uh, what you'll see in our Budget Implementation Act is that we're going to move forward with the measures that we've identified in the budget. There will be some measures in the budget that we're not ready to move forward because there's still more work to be done. 
We've identified those. But there will be all the other measures in our Budget Implementation Act. And I think you can expect that we'll comport ourselves the way we have in the past. We'll try to carefully ensure that we only put things into the Budget Implementation Act that were actually in the budget and uh, do that in a way that can ensure that the measures that we put forth really do have an impact on Canadians in the near term. Good morning, Minister. Jesse Baines from Yahoo Finance. Uh, housing affordability remains a huge concern. Um, how can you be sure that measures like you introduced yesterday to increase demand won't just drive prices higher, especially in places like Vancouver and Toronto, but even more so in lower priced areas? I think in order to understand uh, what our view is on this, you have to look at entirely uh, what we've done yesterday. So we've actually made measures in the housing market in three ways. We've put in place some measures to enforce uh, rules with the Canada Revenue Agency to make sure that people in the housing markets are paying their appropriate tax, uh, dealing with people that aren't, aren't, uh, aren't necessarily appropriately taking the right actions in the market. Uh, we're putting in place uh, teams to look for any sort of money laundering issues in the housing market. These are really important at getting at people who are actually creating demand inappropriately. Secondly, we've put in place some really significant supply measures. We have, over the last few years, put in place funding for rental construction financing. You saw yesterday we put in place an additional $10 billion of rental construction financing. That's going to help us to increase supply across the country of affordable rental units which we see as important. On top of that, we put in place $300 million in a, a municipal supply challenge, encouraging municipalities to come to us with ideas on how they can expand supply. So all these measures to increase supply, which is fundamentally what we need in, in markets like in Toronto and Vancouver, and then very targeted issues around how we can actually help first-time home buyers. And I say targeted because when we think about the overall home buyer market, we have roughly half a million home purchases a year, about 100,000 of them are first-time home buyers, and we think we might be able to actually get some people who aren't quite able to get in there into the market. But we're talking about maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe 40,000 new families, which is really important for those families, but we've done the modeling to show not an issue around changing demand dynamics. So we've, we've been carefully able to, to help those families without actually changing the overall dynamics. And if these measures don't work, are there more options on the table like the mortgage stress test? Uh, and also how much of the onus now falls on cities to follow through? These measures will work. With respect to the, the mortgage stress test, we've been really clear that the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions will continue to look at those stress tests to make sure they're appropriate and having the impact that we were hoping they have. We are and continue to be concerned about uh, overall household debt. This is an important issue for ensuring that Canadians are resilient enough to face up to any changes in the economy. So that will continue to be of importance and OSFI will continue to look at those stress tests. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Minister. Marika Walsh with iPolitics. I, just on your answer to the first question on the potential for, you know, more slowdowns in the economy, if it does stick, what's the backup plan given that we are already in deficit spending? We uh, always consider our fiscal situation as, uh, as an important frame for any discussions around budget. What We've been really clear on from day one is that we can only move forward with a, an approach that guards our very strong situation. We have, as I've mentioned, the lowest amount of debt as a function of our economy among G7 countries. That amount of debt as a function of our economy has been reduced each year we've been in office. And you saw in our budget plan yesterday that we are continuing to commit to decreasing the amount of debt as a function of our economy. So that means that we will have the capacity in whatever economic situation to deal with that situation appropriately. Okay. So two questions. Does that mean that you see more room for deficit spending then? And to David's question on infrastructure, is the infrastructure, the challenge of rolling out money for infrastructure, is that because of recalcitrant provinces? Or is it because provinces just have way less cash to roll out than the feds do? Our approach around infrastructure has been, of course, to work with provinces, to try to make sure that we are getting at the projects that are going to have the biggest impact in people's lives. That means we need to work with municipalities and provinces. Uh, we're doing that. 
in a number of jurisdictions, we've not been able to move to get as fast as we'd like to, and that's led us to say this is appropriate for us to put in place this municipal infrastructure top-up. It's what we committed to in our election campaign, and uh, we're doing it in a way that people are going to see more funding at the provincial, uh, at rather, rather the city level. And you see room for more deficit spending if there's a slowdown? We've been really clear yesterday with our budget uh, that we, uh, we want to continue to reduce our deficit as a function of our economy, and uh, we'll continue to do that. Next question. Hi, Mitch Potter with the Toronto Star. A uh, question on behalf of your constituents in Toronto. In the event with this upcoming election, in the event that you are re-elected, but your government is not, are you committed to sitting in opposition? Would you serve a full term? I'm committed to running again. I'm committed to uh, representing the people in Toronto Centre. That's what I've uh, signed up for, and I've got to tell you, it has been the biggest honour of my life to uh, have that opportunity. Thank you. Morning, sir. Colin with the Canadian Press. Uh, in terms of deficits, uh, some folk argue that you really don't have to balance the books as long as uh, the deficit is, is a small enough number, vis-a-vis -vis GDP or some other threshold. Uh, do you subscribe to that theory that we, ne we don't need to balance the books provided we keep the deficit under control? We want to continue to make sure that we're fiscally responsible as we make investments in Canadians. Uh, my view is that we, we need to protect uh, a huge strength that we have in terms of our strong balance sheet, the underlying balance sheet, that we can continue to make investments and continue to reduce our deficit. Uh, as we've said, we, we will continue to work towards getting to a, a balanced situation. First and foremost, though, we want to make sure that we make the investments that give people the optimism for the future. And that is our first priority. And the good news is that approach has clearly worked. We have a, a much better situation for Canadians with better job numbers, with uh, fewer people struggling to get by than we had three and a half years ago. We're going to keep investing in the future in that way. In terms, of, uh, in terms of your housing measure, uh, you've raised the RSP first-time home buyer limit to $35,000. Uh, how many, especially first-time younger people, have $35,000 sitting around in an RSP that they can put toward a first-time house? Again, I think what's important to look at in terms of what we've done to try to help first-time buyers is we put in place a couple of measures. And so that measure, the ability to take 35000 out of your RSP versus the previous 25000 that will help some people in, in middle-income range as they, as they look towards their first home purchase. Not everyone, for sure. The approach we put in place in, in partnering with the CMHC, allowing people to take a shared equity mortgage, that will help a, a broader cross-section of people who are just not quite able to get into the housing market. So I think we need to look at those two measures together to say that we're really trying to make sure that there's a greater sense of optimism for families that they can get into that first-time home. It's Sean Benjamin from the CBC. Some people are saying that the home buyer uh, measures are just a bit of a gimmick um, and that Canadian home ownership is actually very healthy, um, and maybe these measures are unnecessary. What do you say to that? Canadian home ownership is healthy, and uh, that's, a, that's a positive for, for so many families across the country. But there are people who just don't see the possibility for them and their family. So this is clearly targeted at people who just can't quite get into that housing market. We're doing it in a way that doesn't put people in a, uh, in a difficult debt situation by actually reducing the amount of their debt and reducing the amount of their mortgage payments. So we think this is going to have a positive impact on, on many families that are looking to that next step. And just on the uh, pension um, protection, some people are saying it's, it doesn't go far enough. How can you, uh, what sorts of specific legislation will you bring forward in order to make sure that, that people's pensions are actually protected? We, uh, we've said that it's important for us to consider how the federal government can be involved in this. Uh, you'll probably appreciate that um, only 7% of companies are registered federally, so most uh, companies are registered provincially. Uh, we've looked at ways to make sure that in bankruptcy that executives can't be taking extraordinary sums of money, which puts uh, retirees in jeopardy. We think that's really important. We're going to move forward on measures that are going to protect retirees in, uh, in terms of their pensions, and we're going to do it in a way that, uh, that gives them confidence that what they've worked for is going to be there for them. No specifics? 
specifically? We've specifically said that executives will not be able to take extraordinary amounts out uh, during the course of any sort of receivership. Hai Ying from NTD TV. My question is uh, for the $1.18 billion for border security and the speed up asylum uh, seeker process. And how much of that amount would be, be, uh, would be for the border security? And uh, is it for tightening the border control and the removal effort? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, this, is, this is an important issue. We want to have an immigration system that's compassionate. We also know that we have a country of laws. So in order to have uh, appropriate immigration, we need to have appropriate uh, laws uh, at the border and appropriate processing approaches when people come into, through, into our country in some cases inappropriately. So that money was put there in order to ensure that we have the appropriate border security approaches, but also to imp improve the processing speed for Immigration Canada so that if somebody comes across the border, claims asylum, we want to make sure that we process that quickly so that they either are moved back to where they came from, if it's inappropriate, or in the case where they are legitimately seeking asylum, where we deal with them in a compassionate and rapid way. So we're funding both of those two measures with this budget uh, impact. Thank you so much, Okay, thank you very much.